Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second in our Naturalist Notes webinar series. Um, appreciate you being here this evening. It's been such a lovely day out. Um, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Susie Fortner, um, pronouns she, her. I am the Programs and Operations Director with Friends of the Dunes, and I'd like to invite my co-host to introduce herself as well. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Daisy Ambrice Perez, and um, I'm the Outreach Coordinator, or Outreach Manager, and my uh, pronouns are she, her. Okay, so um, I want to begin by uh, acknowledging that Friends of the Dunes and our staff are working and living on unceded territory of the Wiat people, which include the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. So Wiat people continue to be the working stewards of the lands, waterways, air, plants, animals of their ancestral homelands, which include the stretch of lands between Lut Kasamui, Little River, and Rasiki Uwit. Bear River Ridge since time immemorial. The Wiat people have retained and passed traditional ecological knowledge through generations by mostly oral traditions. These, this knowledge has survived uh, through violent um, colonization, genocide, and attempted erasure of the Wiat people. Today, we want to honor this knowledge by learning about the culture and traditional uses of local flora. So on your screen, we have listed the Sulatlak, or we out words for large bodies of water and cities of this area, as well as our word of the day. So uh, for each webinar, we will be introducing some thematic look, look vocabulary. Uh, this week's word is look up, meaning willow root. And I apologize for my pronunciation, mispronunciation of the words. For those of you that are are not familiar with Friends of the Dunes. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to conserving the natural diversity of coastal environments through community supported education and stewardship programs. Um, we have a lot of members joining us tonight and even had a few members join because of this webinar series. So thank you for your support of Friends of the Dunes. If you're enjoying this webinar series, um, I encourage you to join the whole series and tell friends about it. We are recording these sessions and we can send you links to the videos and passwords um, after, we, um, after the sessions happen. Hopefully by Friday this week, we'll be getting out the recording for this session. Um, the name of this webinar series, Naturalist Notes, has been inspired by a feature in our newsletter, The Dunes Ferry, which goes out to all of our members either um, in the mail or through an electronic copy. Um, so if you become a member, um, which you can do so on our website, then you will, can look forward to a Dunes Ferry coming out soon this spring. And this is our second webinar of six. Um, it's a really great lineup of really engaging presenters. So I'm looking forward to all of these presentations and especially the presentation that we're bringing to you this evening. Um, I think Daisy is going to share some of our quick Zoom overview. Yeah, so um, just a quick uh, housekeeping items. So please feel free to communicate amongst yourselves in the chat. If the chat popping up is bothering you, you can open it up by double clicking on the chat button below on your screen and drag the whole box off to the side. Um, if you have questions for the presenter, please type them into the Q&A rather than the chat. That will make it much easier for us to find the Q, uh, your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, you can also uh, control your, your view of the presentation. So at the moment, hopefully you're seeing me next to, your sli next to the slides. Um, you can control how big my face is or how big the slides are by dragging the bar that divides us. Um, you can also hide the video feed altogether and only view the slides that control, um, and that control is on the top right corner of your screen. So last but not least, these webinars will be recorded and we will send you a link uh, to the video within the next few days. So keep a, a lookout for those. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, welcome our presenter, Adam Cantor. Okay, stopping my share. Mm -hmm. Hi, Adam, welcome. Hello, good evening. Uh, 
Thanks for having me. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Awesome. Thanks for that awesome introduction, Daisy and Susie, and the land acknowledgement. An excellent job uh, with the WIAT vocabulary. It, it, it's very challenging. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very challenging. <laughs> And uh, I'm just gonna give a brief background of the tribe um, and then launch into ethnobotany. Um, here's a map of, of we got ancestral territory. Um, I think, were we, were we able to launch the poll actually? All right, we have a brief introductory poll here. Um, what percentage of we got ancestral territory is presently held by the tribe? Now I, sh I shouldn't have shown you this map first, but Let's see what folks think. And I'll say we got ancestral territory um, was once about 500 square miles. Um, and went from the little river in the north, right, right there south of Moonstone Beach. Uh, to Sakiuit or or Bear River in the south. And let me know when we get those poll results back. It looks like we have uh, about 75% in right now. Oh, a couple more flowing in. I will give you guys uh, five more seconds. And I think I think it's good uh, as we start this talk. Um, to, to kind of put yourself a couple hundred years ago uh, in, in, in the Wiat's place and think about having to get food for yourself and your family and the skills you might need. And, uh, you know, you can't, you couldn't just go down to Ramon's and get yourself a, a, a blueberry scone. Um, you know, uh, actually blueberry scones, you know, huckleberries probably have more sugar than a blueberry scone does. But, um, miss amount of knowledge um, it would have taken. And it looks like most of, let's see, uh, most folks got it right. Yep, less than 1%. And um, the tribe is, is presently, you know, always working on the land return. And um, uh, today I was at the, the 30 by 30 conservation initiative meeting and uh, a potential opportunity coming up next May, um, Wednesday, May 4th, is the 30 by 30 uh, North Coast uh, first public meeting. And so I encourage folks to look into the 30 by 30 initiative, uh, which may prove to be a great opportunity uh, for tribes uh, to get lands returned. This is a map of the California Floristic Province and it kind of helps us think about our eco region here in the North Coast. You can see how, um, you know, associated we are with, with the ocean, with the coast and how small you know, the North Coast microclimate is just right in, right in the fog belt there. And so we have very unique plant communities um, that make a special. Here's a picture, this is one of my favorite pictures and if folks have seen my presentations before, you've probably seen this a million times, but this is Mad River Annie about uh, 1905 at Botwat or Mad River Beach. And you can see all the, the the beautiful baskets and the basket basket materials that she has there in front of her. And I just think it's an, an opportunity to think about how much knowledge and time and um, information, you know, those materials represent um, and uh, the knowledge of the ecosystem and the plant communities it would have taken to collect all these materials. Uh, I like this picture too, because one thing you don't see is uh, European beach grass. And so I think it's cool to see, see a little bit of a bronia and I think some beach tansy there in the dunes. Kind of uh, same, same, same uh, uh, time, 1905, looking north towards the mouth of the Mad River, kind of right near where the, the parking lot is today. And you can see the coastal terrace prairie of, uh, of McKinleyville, it's known as McKinleyville in the, in the background. <clears throat> The Redwood was really indispensable for the Wiat. Uh, they were one of the, actually the first tribe heading north that really employed the dugout uh, canoe. Most tribes south of us used tule rafts. And the Wiat are still a thriving culture. This is at the Wiat Day uh, Festival, which happens usually the last uh, third weekend in August. Um, 
hopefully we'll get to have it. If not this year, next year, we can see the beautiful dentalium uh, necklaces um, that uh, the girls have on, which was dentalium was a form of currency for, for many of the local coastal tribes. And the plank house, the two pitched roof uh, was the standard dwelling of the Wiat, the redwood structure. And with the distinct um, uh, round entrance, which was both for defense, uh, but also as a representation from what I've been told of the pileated woodpecker and, and its holes uh, that would tap into the trees, uh, which was a sacred bird to many of the local tribes. Weat means Eel River, people of the Eel River. Um, and this is out at um, Crab Park, out in the estuary looking uh, south at Saki Uwet, uh, Bear River Ridge. <clears throat> and when you're thinking about the Wiat, um, they're one of the few Algonquin peoples. And you know, I think most of many of our ancestors here at this talk probably took boats to get here, but um, it's cool to think that probably most of the Wiat ancestors might have walked here. Um, and um, the Algonquin language group is only represented um, on the West Coast by the by the Yurok and the Wiat. And it's thought that um, the Algonquin had a, had a, there was a split between a migratory, the migratory group somewhere around the Columbia Plateau and some groups headed west while, while most Algonquin peoples are, are the dominant language group found on the East Coast, which I think is pretty fascinating. Um, one of the, the early kind of ethnobotanical notes uh, from our region about as early as it gets in um, you know, European written history was from the Spanish explorer uh, Vizcano, who apparently was one of the first Europeans to find the mouth of the Eel River and the natives uh, greeted them in canoes um, with uh, trade items trying to encourage them to come up the river fish game hazelnuts, which we're, we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, which is one of my favorite uh, native foods and, and shrubs, uh, chestnuts, which I think we think were probably chinkapins and acorns. Uh, and the Wiat uh, were really, uh, you know, protected and kind of walled off from the outside world uh, by the Redwood Curtain, um, which I think is a good, good analogy. And it, it sort of let, let the culture develop, you know, independently and, 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 um, and and artistically um, in its own right, and, and also uh, protected it from from outside groups. But as we know, the redwood forest can be dark, and um, the coastal prairies around Humboldt Bay were, were really the life source of 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 the plant world for the Wiat people. Um, many of our coastal prairies, of course, have been degraded and, and, and plowed and tilled up and, and planted with non-native Eurasian grasses. But here we're looking at uh, the native bunch grass, uh, Calamagrasta specific reed grass out at Table Bluff by the Table Bluff Reservation. Many of our prairies have been encroached uh, by young Sitka spruce forest, which is, is not very biodiverse. Um, it does provide good mushroom communities, but as we can see, um, our, our ecotones and our edges between plant communities and between prairies and um, interior forests are really where we see the, the most plant diversity. And just some of the prairies um, around Table Bluff and, and Humboldt Bay that would have been just thriving uh, places for the Wiat. <clears throat> and many prairies, um, here we're looking at some uh, actually sand barrier kniknik, which is many people know as a dune plant. And uh, this is one of the only instances I've seen it growing like this in the open prairie, uh, which just makes us think about, you know, what did our landscapes and, and vegetation communities used to look like under management by the Wiat. There's a close up of the urn shapes sandberry knicknick or archostaphylus uber or sea flower and this is the most text you'll see all, all evening but uh this is this is from loud he was an ethnographer that that visited uh, the weot in 1915 
And uh, he was also happened to be a friend of probably California's most famous botanist, uh, Professor Jepson. And uh, he even quotes Jepson, apparently they were friends at Berkeley. And where, um, you know, today there's more wooded area in Humboldt County than the white men came over half a century since. And so that, that was in 1915. And, and this was confirmed, he said, by many, by many folks that he talked with. And the prairies were incalculable value to the, to the natives, not for their vegetable products, but for the game upon them and the sharp contrast that could be found between the animal life in the forest and these prairies. Um, so. Pretty cool, and and as with oral history, we we also have ethnographic history that the Wiyot uh, used uh, fire and cult cultural burning to maintain these prairies, which would have um, halted you know the forest encroachment and maintained early successional vegetation types. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, some special Wiyot places that are you know accessible to the public. Um, Moel Dunes, we all love Moel Dunes. Um, and uh, it has probably one of the more significant uh, Wiyot ethnobotanical sites, um, Moel's name for the Moel village. And um, there's a legacy uh, a geophyte uh, or Indian potato garden um, that, that still, that's, um, that still exists. And uh, this is a picture of, of one of our trips out with the Wiyot youth uh, to help uh, tend, tend the patch from invasive annual grasses and uh, knock out some of the encroaching conifer species. And we're looking here at uh, Bredera terrestris, um, an edible bulb, the purple flower there, and it's growing in a, in a bed of the Kniknik, which we were looking at in that open uh, terrace prairie earlier. There's a picture. Uh, next to some strawberries, you can see the dentate a staminode, which is that white false stamen structure that, that um, has different features, which is kind of diagnostic of different Brodea species. In most Wiyot sites uh, were accessible, uh, most many village sites and most were accessible by canoe. Here we're looking at Batawat Slough or Mad River Slough. And here's, here's a picture of some Indian potatoes. We have a couple of different species, the really uh, um, charismatic uh, white bulb there with the little bulblets uh, starting to pinch off. Um, that's the Indian rice root or the, the uh, chocolate or checker lily, Fritillaria finis. Um, the smaller bulbs are the, the brodea that, that we're looking at there with the white flower and the kind of the one in the middle, lower middle in between is a, a diclostema. Um, uh, bulb. And one, one thing that we're concerned about um, out, out at Moel is, is the lack of indigenous management um, in recent time. This is a picture looking at a cross section of the soil and you can see um, that the bulb, the little white dot there is, is about you know, over a foot, almost a couple feet down. And so um, in the absence of fire and management and tending, the, the duff layers built up. And, and so one question we have is you know, how long, how long can the population sustain um, you know, this lack, this lack of management? Another area that um, where we have um, oral stories and histories of, of collecting Indian potatoes is out at the Lost Coast Headlands, kind of on the southern end of Wiyot territory. And this is a beautiful place uh, that I recommend uh, for a spring hike. And um, this is the flower of, of the one leafed onion, Allium unifolium, which is pretty much our, you know, only native coastal, coastal um, onion species. And this was actually one that, you, you know, used to be seen at Malel um, that hasn't been seen in a few years, but the significance of Malel um, is that um, species like the fritillary and um, the diclostema that aren't really associated with dune environments are found there. So it's really indirect evidence of transplantation um, and incipient agriculture that was really wasn't acknowledged by the early ethnographers. You know, we, we hear these stories of, of, of the natives being, you know, hunters and gatherers, and it sounds like they were just kind of wandering aimlessly looking for food. But you know, I always say, 
you know, you know, the native peoples here were master per permaculturalists. They they really, you know, knew the cycles of nature, um, like the back of their hand, so to say. Here's the allium unifolium bulb uh, um, at, at a at an Indian potato site out in the Lost Coast Headlands, pretty scenic. And there, there's the flower of the, the fritillary, the, the Indian rice root or checker willy, you know, uh, which I always find amazing, you know, in, in these kind of harsh coastal environments, um, that these really delicate um, lilies can, can hang. This is a picture of Labrador tea or swamp tea. Um, this is the, the Coca-Cola of the Wiat. Um, apparently, there was always a pot of swamp tea um, on the fire. And uh, it used to be a species that was more common around Humboldt Bay, um, even 100 years ago, that has you know, almost been extirpated. There's only one population I know of out at Table Bluff. This is a great book if you're interested in the vegetation of California. It's, it's not very technical. Um, it's, on, it's almost like a coffee time, you know, coffee table, bedtime read, um, and really helps lay out some of the, the prominent vegetation communities in California. And for a few minutes, I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna go into hazelnut scrub land. I know some people are probably like, ah, he's going to hazelnut scrub land. But um, uh, hazelnut scrub is a, a series um, in the Northern Coastal Scrub um, Alliance. Well, we are not going to talk about plant alliances and plant communities because that's all changed um, since the Holland um, descriptions. But <clears throat> hazelnut scrub was, a, was a, a scrub type that was thought to only occur on the Central California coast um, in very uh, foggy locations um, kind of around Point Reyes, Marin Headlands. And uh, back in 2014, um, when I first started working uh, for the, for the, the Weot tribe, there you can see its, its range map in this other great, this other great book, uh, Mainal California Vegetation, because, you know, has more, um, you know, laid out like this, uh, not so much of a, of a you know, casual read, but more of a, a guidebook uh, to vegetation alliances in the state. And uh, walking around on Table Bluff one day, uh, ran into some hazelnut, which I'd, I'd never seen growing right right on the ocean. Um, and this is what its flowers look like this time of year. They're, they're very discreet. You can see the kind of red, um, the hot pink pistols there. Um, and of course, which turn in, if, you know, they're pollinated, turn into these delicious nuts. If you can get them before um, before the wood rats and the rodents do. Um, and Michael Kaufman and the Central California hazelnut scrub expert Mike Vasey came up and we confirmed we have hazelnut scrub in Humboldt County. This is out at Elk River um, growing right kind of on a little slewlet there um, which is a site that could be impacted by sea level rise. Um, which is a big concern for the tribe. And you know, when we think about the, the Weat only having 1% of their land holdings, it really poses you know, a challenge to, to the passing on of traditional ecological knowledge and um, the access to gathering areas uh, to continue uh, these traditions. Um, another good place to see, to see hazelnut scrub, actually one of the only real public lands to see it um, is out at the Azalea Reserve um, in McKinleyville, which is an excellent place to go on a walk in the spring. Uh, we've got hazelnut kind of below the Western Azalea there with the California lilac, um, the purple flower in the back. Um, uh, so you know this Thrissophorus, which is very floral and uh, was, if you smell it, you'll understand it, why it was used um, as a soap and as shampoo. Here's a hazelnut scrub thicket up on Table Bluff. You can just kind of see these um, really ornate canopies, which um, as the as the we out would harvest hazelnuts, they would snap off um, the branches, which is, um, effectively was pruning the shrubs while also promoting um, 
increase production the following year. Um, some of this might be a legacy of that, but um, cattle also like to nip on the young growth. And we even have dwarf hazelnuts, hazelnut scrub. Um, this is right out by the Table Bluff Reservation. You can see uh, the non-native invasive um, Monterey pine looming in the background, which along with spruce has, has encroached many of our prairies. Just in another example of the, the coastal prairie um, scrubland mosaic um, that would have been a little bit more common a couple hundred years ago when, when the Wiat were, were using fire to manage the landscape. In the foreground here, more of that you know, scrub and spruce mosaic. Uh, this is coastal bramble scrub. Um, you can see some thimbleberry. Uh, coastal bramble is a rare vegetation type, uh, which was um, consists of several yummy species from thimbleberry um, and uh, blackberry to salmonberry. And here's our salmonberry flower, which is out right now. You can see this in the wild. And soon it will turn into this. And I always say if the Wiat had a mascot berry, it would probably be the salmon berry, um, which I think is the doll in Wiat. And I apologize for not having more um, Wiat language. Um, if you're interested in Wiat language uh, for uh, flora and fauna, you can go to the Wiat website. And um, there's uh, an excellent page there with, um, with downloadable audio uh, and of, of we are plant and animal words. And it's great. Our linguist, uh, um, Dr. Winnika Butler, uh, developed that. And here is our thimbleberry flower. Um, both, both rubuses, you can, you can see the similar, similarity in uh, I just, I love thimbleberry flowers and a lot of people maybe not, don't think much of thimbleberry, but also huge in the Wiat world. The Wiat were really a berry people. Um, and here's an example of some, you know, OG uh, Vaccinium ovatum or evergreen huckleberry um, growing out, you know, an open prairie, which a lot of people always ask me about, you know, huckleberry won't survive in the full sun. It will survive in full sun. I mean, granted, it's kind of foggy here, but um, and uh, this is a this is a site that's been um, where we know for a known uh, five generations um, has has been has been gathered at by we out families. And here we see the urn shaped flower of the evergreen huckleberry, um, which is. Is, an, is a heath, is an air KCE. Um, I think it's, uh, CNPS, the California Native Plant Society has an upcoming talk just on this family, um, which also has the, the Arctostaphylus and the Galtheria, the Salau, um, which so many people I talk to, I, you know, I was like, oh, you can eat, eat Salau berries. They're like, I always thought those were poisonous, um, but they're delicious. Uh, they're super sweet. And there, there was a very common Wiat meal that was eaten um, that consisted, it was, it was kind of a mush of hazelnuts, um, salal berries, and salmon. That, kind of, that sounds good to me. Um, you can see the similarity in, in the flower types. More of our coastal prairie mosaic uh, out by Fernbridge. And we've been lucky to have gotten some funding through different grants, um, through Bureau of Indian Affairs, geospatial grants, to go out and, and cruise we got ancestral territory and look for ethnobotanical areas and sites. And this is one site that we identified near Fernbridge. You can see this giant hazelnut. Uh, there's a little hazelnut scrub patch outside Ferndale with our natural resources director, Eddie Koch. And this was a really fun project that that um, you know because the Wiat unfortunately don't have a lot of land holdings. Um, this this is what you know one of our resorts for identifying a significant vegetation. Um, here's a rare uh, uh, a 
rare plant that's a, also a cultural plant, the Siskiyou checker bloom, um, see that Stalcium alvaflora patula, which the young basil leaves were eaten as a cooked green. And this is out, out towards Alton, which um, was a hot spot of plant diversity back 100 years ago. If you check out Joseph Tracy's records in, in the herbarium records, um, you know, many coastal species kind of merging with, with interior species. <clears throat> and there's some plants that that are coastal prairie plants that we just don't see much anymore, like this gentian. And uh, this is gentian and affinis, um, which grows in native coastal prairie. We also have Gentiana Skeptrum. Um, I put these in here. We, we don't have many cultural uses for them. They're just, they're just uncommon coastal prairie plants. Um, here you can see the capsules of the federally endangered Western lily, uh, uh, which was thought to have been managed as an edible bulb, um, like the other geophytes or Indian potatoes I mentioned. Um, and uh, it's restricted, uh, its range is restricted from Coos Bay, Oregon uh, to Table Bluff, which I think is just fascinating. And uh, I don't think I included a picture of its flower, but many people think it's one of the most beautiful lilies. And, and the, the Labrador tea, the swamp tea, um, Rhododendron columbianum that I mentioned earlier, um, grows, grows at this one Western Lily site out at Table Bluff, the only only site we know of um, where, the, where this still occurs around the bay, which is similar to the nine bark or the physocarpus, uh, uh, which is found, uh, can also be found at the Azalea Reserve. And it's just beautiful as well in the springtime. It was a medicinal plant. And um, in inland, uh, this is more of a coastal shrub. Um, Physocarpus is, is associated with ethnobotanical sites and is thought to have made it, to have been transplanted. This is a, a flower of the camas, the camas bulbs, which are maybe one of the more famous of, of the, the edible bulbs, native bulbs on the West Coast encountered by, you know, written about by Lewis and Clark because it made them so sick. Um, uh, because because they have to be cooked for, for about 24 hours to convert the the, the, the starches to, to sugars. Um, another, another plant that is just not very common anymore on, on the outer coast that would have been tended and managed by the Wiat, that's, that's really only found out at Table Bluff, uh, also associated with Western Lily. And, and of course we have our wonderful um, black cottonwood um, North Coast Black Cottonwood riparian forest, which back uh, when the Holland vegetation types uh, were were kind of um, you know the the standard uh, in California um, was considered one of the the rarer forest types um, in California. Um, you know, maybe not so much. Well, partly because you know. This was our prime coastal bottomland, um, but also just it, 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 you know our riparian areas on our big coastal bottom, you know, um, bottom ones are, are just not that big, and so you you can see this forest, you know, around Blue Lake and the Lower Mad River um, and the Lower Eel River. This is out at, at Cock Robin Island, um, where the Weeot does still retain some land, and you can see a bunch of stinging nettle uh, or meh in Wiat, uh, which I've always been told if you could have one survival plant, um, it would be nettle, uh, a food plant, because it's just stocked with nutrients and, and minerals. And, and, and if you just cook it for, for a few minutes, uh, the stinging hairs go away. Um, the understory is really rich um, in, in, our, in our cottonwood forest too. There's lots of salmonberry and, and thimbleberry. And, um, it's a fun place to hang out when the nettle's not head high. And uh, another coastal prairie plant, um, helenium um, or sneezeweed. Um, and the lower basil leaves of this plant were eaten in the spring. 
And another plant, a uh, plant that's flowering right now, that's uh, one of my favorites, the, the Douglas iris or, or irises in general. Uh, irises were super important uh, because they were the main fiber plant for um, nets, uh, fishing nets or fishing nets, um, and just general cordage. And one, uh, uh, you know, what you hear about is irises are unpalatable to, uh, to cattle, to livestock. So there, there's many stories of, about the, the early settlers ripping out these giant iris beds that used to be, you know, much more dominant in our, in our coastal prairies um, than they are today. Um, you can still, you know, you can still see these beautiful iris beds in places like the Lost Coast um, and other places. Uh, growing next to a, a very, um, you know, well-known cosmopolitan medicinal herb, um, uh, wormwood or um, um, Artemisia the glassii, um, the mugwort or the wormwood, um, which was used for many ailments and is still used um, today and used in uh, traditional art. Uh, wormwoods are used in traditional Chinese medicine um, as well. Here's, a, here's another great picture of, of the checker lily, the Indian rice fruit, uh, Fritillaria finis. Uh, on a sea stack, this is just north, just north of of Wiat ancestral territory, and um, we there are there are Yurok stories of of the sea stack, the sea stack gardens, uh, which I find just fascinating. And here, kind of in the foreground, um, uh, out at Table Bluff. Um, we're looking at another example of the coastal bramble, that, that rare uh, uh, coastal scrub type, which um, is predominant, dominated by salmonberry, uh, blackberry, and thimbleberry. And, and a good place to also see this is up around uh, the Humboldt Lagoons. And, um, you know, I talked about about the berries and the well, but one thing that we're super excited about is is the the recent acquisition um, of Friends of the Dunes of the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands property, uh, which is probably our most um, I don't even want to say this, but you know the most magnificent or largest uh, you know stand of of, of dune forest um, in, in the Samoa Dunes system. And uh, this is an awesome picture, or awesome tree rather, not an awesome picture, awesome tree, uh, Douglas fir, which is not as common as some of the other conifer species. You tend to find it in the, the oldest and the, the most succeeded um, uh, uh, easterly uh, portions of the dune forest. And, and here you can just see these big banner limbs where you know this tree obviously was able to mature in an open environment and, and covered in the polypodium, uh, polypodium fern, poly, polypodium scularii, um, the leather back fern, leather leaf fern, and the dune systems were just notorious or not notorious, but you know well loved for their huckleberry forest, of huckleberry uh, harvest which was a huge happening uh, for the Wiat starting, you know, in September, once the mosquitoes uh, died down, um, the dunes really became a, a bustling, a bustling place. Um, and so we're really excited to, to work with Friends of the Dunes and, and you know, uh, you know, be able to, uh, you know, for the Wiat to, to be able to, to regain access uh, to this amazing property, which has, you know, basically been been locked away for, you know, over a hundred years now. Um, so we're really excited to see, um, to, to, yeah, for this property, and 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 great job to to Mike Sipper and everyone that helped helped with that acquisition. And I, I think this is my last photo. Um, this is this is Melva we we Elder uh, next to her hazelnut in her backyard, uh, which is, is just magnificent. 
And, you know, a shrub like this um, can produce a lot of nuts. And you can see when they're, when they're pruned and they're tended, how full their canopies get and just get loaded with nuts. Um, but I think that's it for my presentation. I think, I, oh my gosh, I finished two minutes early. That's never happened before. Um, so that was kind of quick, uh, a quick tour. Um, and I guess now we're gonna open it up for questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Adam. That was a lot of wonderful information. Um, and I'm looking forward to rewatching it on the recording because I was a little distracted for some of it in the chat. <laughs> and we had some last minute registrations we were trying to get in here. Um, I'm actually gonna read up this comment from Allison Poklimba. This is wonderful, Adam, and, and is helping me see the landscape around in new ways. There's a large Douglas iris patch um, near where I live in freshwater, close to freshwater creek slash slough. Perhaps this was tended for fishing, cordage used along these waterways. So I love that. Yes, I, th I think it's definitely possible. And and what I forgot to mention is, is you know, um, in the same way, the removal of the iris beds is it was almost like the removal of the buffalo because the Wiat were such a surf fishing culture, a fishing culture. And so from what I gather, uh, it takes a lot of irises to make to make these these big surf fishing nets and they needed these huge iris beds and so uh, when they were removed and dug out it, it effectively kind of eliminated um, to to you know quite a you know degree their ability to make nets to be able to fish to to gather food um, so I just think that's something to think about but yes, I certainly think it could be a, a legacy site, especially if it's it's by a slough. The we out love to be able to just, yeah, pull their boats right up <laughs> and, be, and be where they needed to be. That's great. I love um, to make these connections between um, these these patterns we're seeing out there today and the history of them, um, why they are there. So just a reminder to folks, if you do have more questions for Adam, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A um, and we will go through and start asking some questions. And then Adam, up to you, you can keep sharing this lovely photo um, and oh, the video is small or you could stop and then our videos will turn big for participants. So you can see our face. Yeah, see <laughs> okay. Great, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna kick it off with, um, there's actually two related questions or one was a question and one was kind of a comment on that question. Um, didn't the Mad River flow into the Bay 100 years ago? My understanding is that it was rerouted to the North for the convenience of the loggers to get timber to the ships. And then there was a comment um, related that said, I've, I've heard it was routed to the Bay by the logging industry. Yes, from from what from the knowledge I know, it was it was routed to the south uh, to to the bay, and there was a series of boom companies that built these big booms to to redirect the logs um, into the the Mad River Slough uh, Canal and into the bay, and um, apparently that was the beginning of the siltation of the bay. Um, you know, you, you hear about these huge steamers um, that used to come into the bay and how much more navigable the Wiggy or Humboldt Bay used to be. And um, um, once they built the canal, um, it just increased the sediment load into the bay from the Mad River and, and the beginning of, of, you know, the logging boom. Um, and apparently uh, the boom broke uh, once with just an insane amount of logs. And I've heard stories about you know, that there's potentially this buried forest of old growth redwood, you know, that's offshore, <laughs> you know, off of Mad River Beach. But, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to be switching off question asking, so I'll let Daisy get the next one. So um, the next question is, uh, is the round entrance of the Wiat home unique to the Wiat? Or do other tribes do that as well? It is not unique to the Wiat. Um, the Yurok also have the the round uh, door, um, and I I'm not 
positive about the Toa. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but it's not unique to the Uya. Okay, um, next up, we've got a question from Matt. Um, how can people living in Wiat territory help advocate for Wiat management of their ancestral territory? That's a, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I think just, you know, being informed um, ab about, about the community and, you know, projects uh, that are going on the tribe's website, but actually I, I mentioned it really briefly in the beginning of this meeting and and I'm, I'm sort of excited about it. I don't know, you know, what it will turn into, but there's this new 30 by 30 initiative that I was I was talking about um, uh, to conserve 30% of our lands by 2030, uh, which, you know, has a focus of, of trying to, in this process, repatriate or rematriate lands to ancestral tribes. Um, um, and, on May 4th, next Wednesday, there's there's the first North Coast community meeting. And so that would be an excellent op an opportunity to, to advocate for, um, you know, the state, apparently a bunch of money is gonna be dumped into this initiative for the state to purchase land of conservation value to return to the tribes. Um, but... Um, That's great. Adam, maybe you could, um give me more information offline about that meeting and I can send it in the email that goes out to people with the recording so that they have those details. I will. And, and I kind of thought of this last minute because our meeting, the meeting was today, but yes, I'll get folks that, I'll get you that information. Great. Um, so Mike Sipra kind of asked a, a similar question. Um, do you see increasing opportunities for the Wiat tribe to add to their land base for conservation or and restoration? Definitely. Um, I mean, the Wiat are a small tribe. We don't have a, a land um, department like you know some of our other area tribes, like the Yurok uh, tribe. But the opportunity, yeah, I think there's lots of opportunities out there from you know. Uh, working with land trusts and, and willing landowners and kind of, you know, identifying, um, you know, significant, significant sites, of, you know, when they, when they come up on the market or, or working with, you know, other state uh, programs um, and environmental justice programs um, and, and the such, uh, but, um, yeah, you know, I, th I think there's also a new state, uh, you know, um, you know, policy on, on Native American lands uh, that the governor just passed, um, which a policy isn't, isn't, you know, doesn't have as much meat to it. Um, but, but yes, currently the, you know, the, the Wiat are also, you know, looking into uh, really wanting to acquire some forest land. So, in that they don't have, you know, only have this one percent or less than one percent of their their land holdings. There's whole whole com vegetation and ecological communities that the tribe has cultural practices that are associated with that, you know, they don't even have access to or or you know have holding holdings of. And so the tribe would really like to acquire some forest land. Um, and we're we're currently working with. Oh, um, you know, Humboldt State University um, and a committee to look at at um, potentially um, a, a acquiring a piece of the, the Duke Deaton or the Jacoby Creek Forest. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a question here from Lisa Hoover, who happens to be leading our Landfear Dunes walk this coming weekend. <laughs> Adam, can you elaborate a bit on how Landfear Dunes area was utilized by the WIAT, I presume for collection, but perhaps other purposes? Yeah, I talked about the, the berry harvest, um, and I also talked about the, the, the geophyte or the Indian potato gardens, uh, but uh, also for uh, a shellfish and, or excuse me surf fishing um and, and shellfish in the mudflats uh you know on the sloughs but um 
the Wiats were really mas masters at at um, surf fishing, and and had many camps that were out on on the outer dunes um, where where that was that was what they did. Um, but 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 yeah, the 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 dunes were you know uh, it was a it was a huge a, a huge event um during the the very uh the very season and that was kind of the big thing that was going out there i guess food wise otherwise uh, you know other than than surf fishing thank you um so i found this a really interesting question um how long could you sustain yourself on a backpacking trip through humble entirely off foraged plants <laughs> an estimate <laughs> It would depend on what time of year, <laughs> and you know, uh, it, it, you know, you have to think about uh, food preservation too. So I think a lot of us think about, you know, eating fresh berries, but berries were also dried, and so you can imagine um, the value of 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 eating, you know, a berry in your salmon mush in January, um, back in the day. But another another berry that I didn't show a picture of that can be found in in riparian areas in the dunes um, is the Oregon crab apple. And many people don't think about about that as being a, a, a yummy berry, but it's actually pretty delicious. And uh, we don't have any direct you know accounts of it it being like a, a really uh, you know focused species for the weot, but uh, Tri First Nation tribes up in, in British Columbia um, used it as a trade item and it was it was stored in, in these these like you know immaculate cedar chests and and leaders would kind of hoard away the best crab apple organ crab apples of the year um, for big feasts. Cool. <laughs> All right, I've got a question here from L'Oreal, who first says, awesome talk, thank you, Adam, triple exclamation point. <laughs> Is there you. anything about relationships with lichens in the stories, past or present? L'Oreal is gonna be doing a, another webinar on lichens a little later in our series. Not that I know of, I wish there was, because I love lichens and uh, I'm so excited for, for your talk. Um, um, I don't know, you know, um, the lobarias have been used medicinally in many cultures, um, but I don't, you know, um, not that we know of. Well, I take that back. Um, um, Ramelina and Usnia, you know, were, were most likely used for, um, how do I want to put this, uh, utilitarian purposes uh, for, you know, diapers for babies. And, you know, um, like we would use paper towels or, or toilet paper um so it was a or bedding um so yeah ah uh, that's interesting bedding <laughs> diapers <laughs> <laughs> um so this one is from veronica and i'm probably gonna mess up on the um on the scientific name. So I'm probably just gonna say the, the common name. <laughs> uh, can you speak to any uh, use of silverweed and or coastal clover as a food source? And thank you so much for your presentation, for your excellent presentation. Excellent question. And I knew, you know, you can't talk about every species and, and I've talked about those before. Um, and I think we're talking about uh, Potentilla and Serina Pacifica um the the silver weed i think that's his common name the potentilla and um and trifolium worm and so the the we were also a clover people and clover was how did i forget to talk about clover um you know a really prized uh fresh uh green um and while we don't have any direct ethnographic history of the we eating or cultivating or tending those two species, um, you can find them growing together um, and potentilla marsh is a rare vegetation type 
um, in really, really nice uninvaded high salt marsh around Humboldt Bay, kind of associated with we got village sites, kind of. Um, and we know that this was a major practice that was also used by the First Nations um, peoples in, in British Columbia and Alaska, um, where they would actually tend both those species um, in high marsh and they would they would actually um, modify and and fill uh, high marsh to to expand habitat for those two plants. Um, and I'm forgetting the name of, of the tribe right now. So I, I have to think that that was probably a common knowledge amongst coastal peoples um, down the coast. And the we you know, there there is definitely a connection between all the Pacific North the Western coastal tribes and the we are kind of that that first tribe um, as you as you head up the coast. Um, so yeah, I, I love trifolium worm skiodii. Um, you know, another plant that was it also grows in coastal prairie. Um, that was that was probably you know definitely much more common uh, back before we got the Europeans got here. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, yeah, and those those uh, scientific names are nothing for you. <laughs> what was I love it? The ODI. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> um, okay, question from Natalia: Where can you locate chestnuts and salmon berries um, in Table Bluff? There's lots of salmon berries along the roads um, at Table Bluff. And um, what was the other plant? <laughs> Sorry, salmon berries and chestnuts. Oh, so yeah, chestnuts in that in that quote, uh, I have to think were chinka pins. And so um, I don't know of any chinka pin right at Table Bluff. And so we have to we have to ask ourselves. Chinka pin does grow close to the coast. Um, you know, like if you go down to like the Lost Coast area, and um, Actually, I think someone someone told me they they found some some chinka pin actually somewhere near Eureka, but um, it could it could have been an item that was you know a a tree that used to be more common closer to the coast, or was traded for um, that the weot traded for. But I've never eaten chinka pin. Uh, anyone eaten a chinka pin? A native chinka pin? Yeah, I'm not sure. And I'm wondering if maybe Natalia meant the hazelnut potentially, oh. um, instead of chestnut. Possibly. Um, <laughs> there's there's hazelnuts place. along the roads too. Um, yeah. And then I have a, a comment from Susan Penn about the hazelnuts as well while we're on the topic, but not a question, but want to let you know that we found a small clump of hazelnut at what we are calling the Weegee Wetlands behind Bayshore Mall on our last work day. I was excited. Behind Bayshore Mall? I think wow. she means uh, that wetland area that used to be, it's kind of around where De Devil's Playground was. Wow, that's really awesome. Hikshari Trail, maybe? That's really low. I would love to see that. That's, that's fascinating. It, it, it actually occurs at uh, Fort Humboldt, which um, I think is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and hazelnuts, it's hard to date shrubs, um, but hazelnut experts think that, that you know, the, um, the root mass can, can look to be very old. So even though they can be burned and pruned down to the ground, um, you know, some of these, some of these um, thickets uh, could be several hundred years old. So it's pretty cool to think about. Wow. Yeah, and Susan is saying that she will show you. <laughs> so awesome. connect with Susan about that. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so uh, next question by Steph Morian. Um, where can we learn more about traditional weop plant uses? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I th let's think about that. Um, there is the ethnography by Loud, which is a good a good source. Um, 
And you can learn about We Ought Plant names on the website, um, but there isn't really a great place, um, a great place. There's a really cool ethnobotany website called BRIT, B-I-R-T. And um, there's also um, a local uh, um, ethnobotany database that is, is actually really good. Put one of these in the chat. But um, yeah, you know, more has been written about, you know, more ethnic, you know, the Karuk and the, and the Yurok and the Tola have all had ethnobotanies that have been published um, that we ought have not. It's on my to-do list. But, um, you know, some, some tribal members have mixed feelings about sharing even the knowledge that I've shared with you today um, um, about these plants. And so there, there's there, there's lots of mixed mixed opinions um, about the exploitation of of tribal traditional ecological knowledge. Um, so I don't take the knowledge that I've shared with you today lightly, and I don't think any of us should, and um, certainly don't want to exploit it. <laughs> um, so yeah. Great, thank you for that. Um, I've got a question here from Andrew and I apologize for the pronunciation of this place name in advance. How about the prospects of returning Sakiwit to the Wiat tribe? Yeah, I think, you know, I keep talking about this 30 by 30 thing, but um, yes, I, I think so. Um, uh, I, I think some of these really large, you know, ranches that, um, you know, it's, it's just interesting times with, with real estate in California. And so many of these huge ranches have really huge property taxes. And, um, you know, it, it becomes harder for families to, to maintain these properties. And, you know, rather than them develop them or, or you know, subdivide them, you know, I, I hope that, you know, the tribe and local groups and I don't know the state, I don't even want to say the state, but maybe the state can can kind of step in land trusts um, to help get places like Saki Ewitt protected. Um, but it would be amazing. It would be amazing for uh, the Weot or, or the Bear River. Um, yeah. To, to get a to get a um, to be able to to get a um, a cultural landscape like that back. Can you clarify for some of us, um, Sakiwit? Where is that located? Uh, Bear River Ridge, and so that's um, it's a part of the Cape Mendocino Headlands National or, um, or important bird area, um, which is is kind of a connection, a, a big ridge that goes from Cape Mendocino, um, I think about 17 or 18 miles um, uh, east all the way to to the Eel River at at Scotia. And uh, um, it's it's one of the largest coastal prairies um, in Northwest California. It's, it's like a 17 mile kind of contiguous prairie. Um, this is a, it's an amazing biodiversity hotspot and, and cultural area. And, you know, I, I if a lot of people have been to Bald Hills and Redwood National Park, uh, so I don't. It's somewhat comparable. I um, if I were to describe it, but but more coastal. Um, uh, tan oaks, really, really magnificent tan oak um, groves and pepper woods that you know, that were known to have been tended by, by the tribes and hazelnuts and lots of plants, <laughs> uh, bulbs. Uh. Great, thank you. Um, we do have just one last question if you're willing to hang on for a couple, just one more. Mm -hmm. We are uh, 
few minutes over, but we still have about 31 people hanging in there so far. Um, will you please elaborate on the symbology of the round door on the traditional WIAT buildings it's from L'Oreal? Well, I'll say that I don't actually know. Um, and I actually just found out about that symbology. Um, I had kind of always thought the round door was, was more, I don't know, for defense, but um, yeah, I don't know that symbology, um, but the pileated woodpecker, uh, I know it's associated with that and, and the, that's a very sacred uh, bird uh, to, to many of the local tribes and uh, pil uh, pileated uh, woodpecker scalps uh, were, were used in ceremonies and, and were, were, were also used as, as kind of a, a currency, um, like dentalium shells were. Great, thank you. Well, that is um, all of our questions. Actually, I'm gonna end with one really light, more lighthearted one. What is your um, very favorite uh, wild harvested plant? I think I said I said it earlier, but I think ha hazelnut. And I, 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 you know, so I encourage everyone to to try to try them. There's not a lot of a meat in the native hazelnut, but I think they're so much better than like the the filberts or the the European hazelnuts uh, that that you get in the store. And I always wonder, you know, maybe one day we'll have you know we got hazelnut roasted coffee or something, you know, here. Um, and the the hazelnut um, hazelnut broth uh, was was a common um, remedy um, for sick babies and sick elders and anyone that was sick. Um, it's very rich in fat protein, I think. I would definitely try some hazelnut coffee. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Thank you for being here. That was a really great presentation. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate your time and your expertise and sh taking the time to share it with us. Um, getting lots of thank yous in the chat here. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks to everybody for attending also. Um, we will be getting that recording out to you very soon. Um, if not tomorrow, definitely by Friday. All right, so thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for all the great questions and for being here. And thank you friends of the dames for all you do. All right, good evening everybody.